Okay. So as we wrap up the last session of the um, morning of the conference, so, uh, I think it's my real pleasure to thank the organizers for organizing such a wonderful conference um, in such a great city. And now it's my pleasure continues to introduce David Rabati, who will be giving his last, from the University of Vienna, who will be giving his last lecture. Thank you very much. And again, also, uh, let me join, uh, join John to thank the organizer for this very nice conference. And so today I want to uh, continue the discussion that we started last time. Uh, so let me remind you what we were doing. We are in our preferred setting of compact quotients of SL2R. The oro cycle flow is our unperturbed, very nice homogeneous flow. And in the last few lectures, we studied, uh, we started looking at some perturbations that you can do. Namely, uh, we perturbed the flow by uh, changing the, the vector field. And the, the, the perturbation was given by fixing a positive smooth function with normalized to an integral one. And considering the new vector field that you obtain by rescaling the vector field generated the standard or cycle flow by one over alpha. And these are called the time changes. Uh, so this is a simple type of perturbation, or at least apparently simple type of perturbation that preserves the orbit. And uh, last time we studied the ergodic and mixing properties of this, uh, of this type of, uh, of this type of perturbations. And today I want to, and we started talking about the natural question that is, uh, if I give you a time change of the oral cycle, so how do you know that what I've given you is a genuinely different flow from the flow I've given you? Maybe. Uh, there is a situation like the one here in the in the board where uh, you can find some map, uh, some measurable automorphism uh, psi that we can think of it as a change of variable that actually describes your time change h alpha t as the uh, unperturbed flow. Um, so last uh, time uh, we proved that. that well, I, I, we mm, uh, reminded ourselves of the notion of co-boundaries, namely co-boundaries are functions that can be written as a derivative of some other function in the direction of uh, the flow. So co-boundary for the or cycle flow is a derivative of some other function in the direction of the or cycle flow. And then almost co-boundary or a function that is homologous to constant is the function such that it differs by a co-boundary by a constant. And Last time we proved that if the function alpha that induces the time change h alpha is an almost co-boundary, then actually the time change is isomorphic to the unperturbed oral cycle flow. And the regularity of the isomorphism is the same as the uh, regularity of the function that you are deriving to obtain uh, alpha. And so we saw the proof of this lemma. Uh, and uh, the proof actually tells us how to construct this uh, isomorphism psi. In particular, if uh, by assumption, if alpha is an almost co-boundary, alpha minus one is a derivative of some function beta, and then our isomorphism psi was given exactly by pushing uh, points in the direction of uh, the oral cycle flow by beta. So not only we know that there is an isomorphism, we also know uh, what this isomorphism is. And now the question is, can there be other isomorphism? Or what about the converse result? Uh, so the, this is the proof that we saw last time. And the answer to this uh, type of question was given by uh, Marina Ratner in a very uh, striking uh, result that I'm going to uh, explain now. Well, I'm going to state. So uh, recall that our compact quotient is given by quotient on the left. So every time I have an element in my group, uh, in my SL2R, that is in the normalizer of gamma in G. So if it's uh, an element such that n times gamma times n minus 1 is again equal to gamma, this is a condition is being in the normalizer of gamma, then I can define 
uh, map the capital psi that is takes a point gamma g and uh, sends it to gamma times n times g. Okay, so the fact that this map is well defined comes from the fact that I chose n to be in the normalizer. So I point gamma g, capital gamma g could also be capital gamma little gamma times g, but by this relation, this, this map is still well defined. This is an algebraic uh, uh, automorphism of this, of this uh, quotient here. Okay, so what Ratner proved is this result, namely she proved the converse direction. So assume that there exists a measurable isomorphism little psi that conjugates your time change to the unperturbed or cycle flow. Then, this isomorphism takes a very specific form. In particular, I can write it as a combination of a map capital Psi N of this form, so an algebraic map of this type, composed with a little push in the direction of the Eurocycle flow. So it, she basically proved that all isomorphisms between a uh, time change of the Eurocycle flow and the unperturbed Eurocycle flows are of the form we saw last time, so a little push in the direction of the Eurocycle orbit, plus possibly a measurable, a, a algebraic map of this, of this form. What was n in the previous proof? There was no n in the previous proof. Okay. Uh, but uh, you, you can have one. I mean, if you, yeah, if you define a map like this, you still obtain an automorphism. Uh, in particular, from mm, this expression, you can deduce that the function alpha that induces your time change is an almost boundary where beta is your transfer function. OK, so this is a, a very, this is a, um, a type of uh, rigidity. Uh, what do I mean by rigidity? I mean, rigidity maybe in dynamics has several meanings. And in this context, uh, rigidity happens when you take a weak form of equivalence, in this case, measurable isomorphisms, that is a very weak form of equivalence, and automatically you can deduce a much stronger one. So you assume that the flows are just measurably isomorphic, and all of a sudden you can find that the isomorphism takes a very rigid form, and the time change uh, has to be of a very special, of a very specific type. So this is a rather, um, in my opinion, <laughs> a very remarkable uh, theorem. Um, other questions on the statement? So the proof is uh, quite um, uh, challenging. It's, it's long and uh, uh, quite technical. I will try later to uh, give an idea behind uh, her proof. Uh, but for the moment, I want to prove a much more modest result. Namely, I will try to prove the following. So assume that the time change and the unperturbed flow are C1 isomorphic. Imagine that there is a C1 isomorphism between these flows, then the function that uh, induces the time change is a continuous almost boundary. So that you can actually write it as alpha minus one is the derivative of some other function beta in the direction of your cycle. So, so this is a much uh, weaker result because instead of assuming a measurable isomorphism, I'm assuming a smooth isomorphism, but still we can, it, it's a partial converse, right? We assume that there is a isomorphism, and yet we can deduce uh, that uh, the time change, the function that induces the time change, has to be of a very special type. So, in particular, if you knew that this function was not a continuous almost co-boundary, then you can say, okay, at least from a smooth uh, point of view, these two flows are different flows; they are not isomorphic. That's the okay, so we can prove this uh, this proposition, and. Uh, uh, the key uh, input, and uh, um, it will also be the, the core principle driving the proof of Ratner is that the divergence of points is polynomial in, in time. So that if you take two nearby points and you flow them with your cycle, they will diverge, but at most uh, polynomially. So this is the real uh, um, important thing that we are using to prove these types of results. Okay, so how do we prove this? I'm going to give the proof now. So assume that we are in this situation over here. So that there exists this psi that is a C1 map that conjugates the time change with the unperturbed flow. 
So since everything is smooth, I can take differentials. And by the chain rule, uh, so the differential of this right hand side has to be equal to the differential of this left hand side, that I can write it as the differential of the time t map of the euro cycle flow at the point psi of p times the differential of psi of p has to be equal to the differential of the time t map of the time change flow times the differential of psi at the point h alpha t of c psi. Okay, so this is the <laughs> relation that I have from my from my assumption the conjugacy plus the fact that psi is c1 and i will now what i will do i will compute the two uh, sides of this equation so this this is a differential so i will apply to some vector field i will apply to the geodesic direction compute the left hand side and the right hand side separately and then compare what what i get okay so again we'll compute these guys and apply to the vector field x and, and see what we get Okay, I, um, in the following, I'll just suppress the dependence of the base point, not to have super massive formulas. And let us start with some observations. So by assumption, psi was my C1 conjugacy. Therefore, the, the differential of psi applied to the vector field generating the time change of the euro cycle. So has to be equal to the vector field generating the euro cycle. So this is the... Uh, that asking that the psi is a conjugacy at the level of vector fields. Okay, this is the first observation. The second observation is that I'm assuming that psi is a C1 map. So its differential is continuous and I'm working on compact spaces. <coughs> so if I apply the differential of psi to some vector field W, then the x and u is my basis of my uh, tangent. It's a, it's a frame, right? It's a, so I can write it as a linear combination of these three uh, vector fields, or tangent vector if you fix the points in this case. And since psi is continuous on a compact space, the coefficients are uniformly bounded on the point. This is uh, where I'm using the C1 assumption. OK, so the image of any uh, vector or at any point, the image of any tangent vector is a linear combination of V, X, and U. So uh, maybe I should remind this U was the generator of my Euro cycle flow, X is the generator of the geodesic flow, and V the generator of the unstable Euro cycle flow, the other. And the coefficients will depend on the point, but a priori will depend on the point, but they are definitely, the absolute value is going to be uniformly bounded on. Okay, so we had to compute uh, all those differentials, and the simple, the simpler one is the differential of the time t map of the Euro cycle. So, because we computed in the first lecture, or at least we 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 remember how to do it, I have to compute the adjoint of this uh, of the matrix one t zero one. So, if you do just uh, the product of matrices and see what you get, you get that if you push the geodesic flow with the horror cycle flow, you get x plus tu. OK, so we encounter this uh, form of uh, relation even when we were talking about the mixing by a shearing method. In the mixing by a shearing method, we were taking short geodesic segments, push them with the horror cycle flow, and we were seeing that those segments becomes very long in the direction of the horror cycle. And this is exactly what this uh, relation is telling you. If I take the vector field x, I get another uh, vector field or family of tangent vector that has same, the, same, um, the same length in the direction of the geodesic, but I'm getting sheared. The more I push with t, the, the larger this component becomes in the direction of your cycle flow. OK, so this is the same phenomenon we saw in the mixing by a shearing written in, uh, using differentials. Mm -hmm. And if you do the same uh, <laughs> Uh, computation for the unstable or cycle flow, you get again that the image is going to be something of the same uh, with the same component in the direction of the unstable or cycle, and then you get a shear, a linear shear in the direction of the geodesic, and the quadratic shear in the direction of the stable or cycle. And also, we saw this type of uh, uh, not quite this, but we saw something similar again when we were talking about the mixing via shearing, and we saw that if you if we push um, 
transverse curves that curves that are transverse to the weak stable foliation of the uh, geodesic flow, we were seeing that they were very close to uh, or a cycle orbit of length t square. And again, uh, it's in a sense coming from this relation. So pushing these segments with your cycle flow for time t, you get a quadratic uh, shear in the direction of the stable or cycle. But this follows from algebraic computation with matrices, if you like. But it's good to keep a geometric picture in our head. And uh, again, so the, the fact that the cycle flow is a parabolic flow, if you want to, comes from or, or can be interpreted uh, heuristically, at least uh, with these relations. The, the shear is linear for in the geodesic direction and the quadratic in the other direction. So the, the um, yeah, the, the the shear between points is at most quadratic polynomial in, in time. Okay. So I can compute one other side of my uh, of my equality that I had at the beginning. So the differential of the or cycle composed uh, with the uh, psi. And I want to apply it to the geodesic flow and see what happens. Okay, so the first equality is the, just the chain rule that we saw before. Now, this term, the, the second term over here, I can write it as a linear combination of V, X, and U, where the coefficients will depend on the point, but again, they are continuous functions. So I will just leave them as they are. And I have to, to this uh, vector, I have to apply the differential of the euro cycle slow at time t, but uh, from the computation, basically this differential does also not depend on the point psi of p. So I apply the differential at v and I get fxp times the expression we saw in the previous slide. I apply dht to x and I get x plus du multiplied by its coefficient. And uh, the push forward of the euro cycle flow with the uh, the, the vector field generated your cycle flow with your cycle flow is itself right so the last term stays stays the same okay and now i just refactor the terms so what i what i get i get something that is of constant order in the direction of the unstable direction in or unstable or cycle direction something that is at most linear in the geodesic direction and something that is at most quadratic in the uh, stable or cycle direction Okay, so let's keep this in mind and try to compute now the other, uh, the other side. Okay, so this is the other uh, side of the equality that we need to compute, and then uh, we'll compare the coefficients. Okay, let us start by computing the what happens when I push the geodesic flow with the now this time the time team up of the time change flow. Okay, how do I compute this? I remember, I, I, I don't know what this is at the moment, but I do know what is its derivative with respect to t. I recall, uh, also we saw this in the first lecture, the derivative of this quantity with respect to t, well, actually with the minus in front, is the d bracket, is the lead derivative by definition. So the derivative with respect to t of what I'm interested in is the lead derivative of the vector field that I'm trying to push with respect to the uh, vector field generating the uh, time change. Does this make sense? Okay. So I have to compute this lead derivative. And now I, I try to uh, remember how to do it. So this is L alpha minus one U of X. I can write it as a Lie bracket of one over alpha U comma X. So this by definition is one over alpha u x minus x applied to one over alpha u. This is the the d brackets, and now I leave one over alpha u x minus. And here I have to um, do the product rule, so I have minus x applied to one over alpha times u minus one over alpha x u. Does this make sense? So now this term is 1 over alpha, the lead derivative of x with respect to u, minus this term. OK, so if I compute this lead derivative, I get 1 over alpha, the lead derivative of x with respect to u, minus the derivative of 1 over alpha in the direction x times u. 
this is some computation. And now this, I remember how to do it because this is just the Lie brackets. So it's the multiplication of the matrices, right? So I, get, I do ux minus xu using the matrices. And I find that uh, L u of x is exactly u. And this I leave it as it is. So I can rewrite this derivative as one over alpha, well, minus one over alpha plus x of one over alpha times u. That I can rewrite in this way. So I factor a one over alpha and I recall that one over alpha u is u alpha. So here I just factor a one over alpha. And I wrote x of one over alpha as minus x alpha divided by alpha squared. Okay, so we found, so I want to find this, this term over here, and I found its derivative with respect to t. So I can just integrate this OD. So if I write in general what this guy is supposed to be, so this is going to be a linear combination of x, u, of v, x, and u alpha, with some coefficients that I want to determine, what I do know is that if I differentiate this equation with respect to t or minus t, well, on this side, I get the derivative of the coefficients. And on, the, on this side, I, I get this term over here. So this is a, this is a system of three uh, linear or ordinary differential equations. So this coefficient, there is no terms in V on the right hand side, but this is going to be this equal to zero. This term is also equal to zero because there is nothing on the right hand side. And this term over here is going to be equal to this, this guy. And the initial conditions are, well, this is zero. The, at time zero, I don't have any V component. At time zero, I have uh, X, I'm pushing X. So at time zero, this coefficient is going to be one. And at time zero, this is going to be zero. So these are the three equations with the three initial conditions. And I can solve it, I mean, uh, this is equal to zero and is equal to one at one, so it's going to be a constant. And this at zero is equal to zero, and its derivative is this one. So the solution is x plus the integral of that guy at u alpha. Does this make sense? Okay, so the, uh, if I start from my vector field x and I push it with the time to map of the time change or cycle flow, I get again x plus something that grows in, or expected to grow in uh, t in the direction of the time change flow. But this time, uh, the difference is that the coefficient is non constant anymore. I mean, we don't expect it to be constant. Right? So it's not the amplitude of the flow, right? And, but the, the, key, the key point is that the coefficient, the coefficient in the direction of the time change function uh, of the time change uh, vector field, okay, it's non constant, but it's a nice ergodic integral. And this is going to be, it's a nice ergodic integral where the expected value of the mm, function here in the middle is uh, one. And this is zero integral. So it's something that oscillates, but it's growing like t. So you, you still have a shear, kind of linear shear, but uh, non cost. Okay, so this was the push forward of X push with the time change uh, or cycle flow. And now I have to uh, push it again with the differential of psi. And we remember that the differential of psi was sending U alpha into U and X into a linear combination of the other guys. So the left hand side of the equation is going to be the differential of psi at the point h alpha t applied to this expression that we found. So the differential of psi applied to x, it will be a linear combination of v, x, and u with some coefficients that I don't know, but again, remember they are uniformly bounded. And then the, <clears throat> the expression, the, the push forward of u alpha with the psi, psi is the isomorphism, so it's going to be u. Okay, now I have found the, the expression for the other side, and now I equate what I get. Okay, so the, here on the top, I have the expression I just found, and here below, I have the expression I found uh, uh, previously. Okay, but now there is something interesting. So look at the coefficient in U. 
So on this side is this function at that I don't know, but this was an ergodic integral up to t. Here on the other side of the equality, I have something that, at least for some p, will grow like t squared. This is not possible, right? I mean, the, this uh, f x v p has to be zero because otherwise I have here something that grows like t and here something that grows like t squared. So this term here has to be zero. And if I compare the other coefficients, I have that a of t p minus t of f x p is going to be equal to this coefficient over here that is uniformly bounded. So I have that the difference of a, my term a t p minus t times some uh, function that depends on p, but again, constant is bounded by a constant. OK, so recall that this a t was an ergodic integral. So if I divide by t, I have a, lim a, a limit as t going to infinity of an ergodic average. And this is going to converge to the expected value of the function here in the brackets, that is 1. So AT, ATP over T is going to converge to 1. But this has to also be equal to F of XXP, right? And here on this side, I don't have the dependence on P anymore. So this means that FXXP has to be equal to 1 everywhere. Does this make sense? So I get that uh, f, uh, f x x p is equal to 1. So I have that a t of p minus t is bounded by a constant. And a t is this integral. So if I subtract t, I am essentially removing this one. So what we found is that there exists some constant such that a t p minus t is uniformly bounded in the point and for all times. Right? So what can we say when we have something like this? Um, we recall that uh, the horocypo uh, flow, well, the John proved that this uniquely ergodic, in particular, is minimal. Uh, at least at this point, we should be convinced it's uniquely ergodic. So it's minimal. So we have a minimal flow on a compact metric space, and we have some function whose ergodic integrals are uniformly bounded. Uh, there is a theorem uh, that is, uh, <coughs> uh, ah, yes, sorry. At first, I can do a change of variables. So here I have x alpha over alpha integrated with the, uh, integrated with respect to the time change of the cycle flow. But I can do the same change of variables I did other time and rewrite this integral as an integral of x alpha along the unperturbed of cycle flow. Because we recall that 1 over alpha was precisely the derivative of the function tau that was telling me the change of uh, time parameterizations. So I have that the ergodic integrals of x alpha with the unperturbed or cycle flow is uniformly bounded by a constant. So what I want to what I want to prove is that if the ergodic integrals of x alpha are uniformly bounded, this is what we just obtained, then I want to prove that alpha is a continuous co-boundary and this will conclude my proof. Okay. OK, let me uh, simplify. And OK, so maybe I will say a word first. Uh, so once you have something like this, uh, the Eurocycle flow is uh, minimal. So you have a theorem that is called, uh, like a theorem by Kotschak and Endun that tells you that uh, this condition happens if and only if this integrand function is a continuous co-boundary. So we are going to apply this, this theorem. So let me assume uh, that uh, alpha is an eigenfunction of the Casimir. OK, so there, there is another way of uh, deducing this uh, result. I just want to use something that we proved uh, before. So let me assume that uh, alpha is an eigenfunction of the Casimir with positive uh, Casimir parameter. So what we prove in the lecture two is that the ergodic integrals of x alpha uh, can be expressed as a sum of two coefficients that grow like t to the sum power, evaluated at my functions uh, associated to the function x alpha. And now I know that these integrals are uniformly bounded in t. This means that these functions over here have to be 0, because otherwise they would grow. And 
So we know that these guys are zero. And what I there is a something that I didn't prove, but uh, uh, you can still verify it because remember we found some explicit expression for what this function is, and you can actually prove that if you evaluate this function for a derivative with respect to x, you can actually rewrite it as a linear combination of the functions um, associated to the function alpha itself. Uh, so for, yeah, so for, for mu less than one quarter, d uh, associated to the function x alpha is actually going to be a, a constant times the function d associated to alpha. And for mu larger than one quarter, there is a slightly more complicated relation. So since we know that these are zero and the, the, this guy associated to alpha are just a linear combination of these guys, well, these are also zero as well. So what we found is that also the, by, by this same formula, this time applied to alpha, because we just proved that this guy associated to alpha are also zero, the ergodic integrals of alpha are also uniformly bounded. And now I use the gottschalk edelman theorem to prove that alpha is a continuous commander. Okay, there is another way of uh, proving this lemma. Uh, so uh, the work of uh, Flamini and Forni, mm, uh, they, they studied the uh, boundaries for the euro cycle flow, and they proved that essentially there are objects like the ones we found here um, that tell you precisely when the function a function is a continuous uh, is a boundary. And they prove that uh, those objects satisfy the same relation as uh, these functions over here. So that those objects apply to a derivative in the direction of your uh, geodesic flow are proportional to the same object applied to the function without taking the derivative. Uh, yeah, so this applying the gottschalk endum theorem, you get that the, the function alpha has to be a continuous one. Other questions on the. Does the hypothesis that C was C1 imply that alpha is sort of bounded from below? Uh, alpha, I always assume. So alpha is given is the function yeah. defined in the time change. I mean, this is from the hypothesis. It doesn't apply for. I don't think that apply for any alpha generally. Uh, so I. I do want to start from a time change that is a smooth flow. So I would always assume that uh, my function alpha is smooth. But you can ask about the, the beta. So the, um, sorry, I'm going back. Yeah, so the beta, you can ask about the regularity of the beta. The beta is the function that then will. Yeah, I was thinking alpha maybe not be too. One of the other will be too big. I mean, I'm always assuming that alpha, so I'm in a smooth, I'm in a compact space, and I assume it's bounded from below, like away from zero. Yes. It's always away from zero. I, I assume that. Um, yes. Because you just say greater than zero, but not an epsilon away from I mean, it's uh, so alpha, I assume it to be smooth, and uh, it's non negative, but I'm in a compact space, so oh, it, it yes. follows that it's bounded away from zero. So also one over alpha is bounded away from okay. zero. Yes, yes, but maybe I should have stressed that. Um, so we proved that at least uh, like a partial converse, right? So the assuming that C1 isomorphism tells you that alpha has to be a continuous almost boundary, And you can actually prove a bit better, like it's not just continuous, but uh, <clears throat> the, the proof at least is, uh, I mean, they are some, it consists of some long computations, but uh, the key idea was uh, compare the shear uh, uh, of points in the geodesic direction on, for the Amberton flow and for the time change flow. And uh, the conjugacy tells me that the, 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 the comparison between these two uh, shear has to be uh, bounded. Uh, I mean, they, they have to be pretty much the same, and therefore I get some strong conclusion on the function that induces the time change. <laughs> okay, so this was the end of the proof. So now I want to 
briefly discuss uh, one idea behind uh, the proof of Ratner theorem that is much more powerful and the proof is also much more complicated, but I, I want to try to describe one idea. So I recall that the statement was saying, assume that you have a measurable isomorphism between the time change flow and the amperture flow, then uh, there exists some uh, element in G in the normalizer of gamma, such that the uh, isomorphism, isomorphism psi was a composition of a push in the along the orbit with some function beta that is going to be measurable, composed with this algebraic map. Okay, and the proof of Ratner theorem relies also on the uh, polynomial divergence of orbits. This is the key uh, <coughs> insight. And so I want to I want to present in pictures uh, one idea behind the, the proof. And so namely, I want to try to convince you or uh, outline an argument that to prove the following. Okay, so. So I start from some point P, okay, and I apply my uh, isomorphism psi, I get to some other point, uh, psi of P. I'll call it P prime. Okay, what else do I know? Well, I know that psi is an isomorphism between time change and number of flow, so I know that if I take some point on the orbit of uh, P, so if Q is equal to H, uh, uh, R of P, well, I know, I also know where this point goes under Psi. It will go on the orbit of Psi of P. So Psi of Q has to be in the orbit of uh, Psi of P because, uh, because of the commutation relation, this is going to be H of R prime alpha. So by the commuting, I will get that Psi of Q is going to be Psi of P composed H uh, some other capital R composed with the uh, Psi of P. This is by, by the commutation. So what I want to try to, I want to find some other information. So now let me take some other point, uh, U tilde, not on the orbit of P. And I, let me take uh, a point Q tilde um, that I can obtain starting from P and moving along the geodesic direction. So let me take Q tilde to be, I don't know, uh, the point P after I apply the geodesic flow for a time epsilon. And maybe I took minus epsilon first. Okay, anyway, uh, a, a bit away from P in the geodesic direction, and I want to know where is it with respect to psi of P. This is what I want to try to do now. And what, uh, so a priori, I, I don't know, it could be anywhere. But what I want to try to uh, outline and hopefully convince you is that psi of Q will actually be equal to psi of P composed with the same amount in the geodesic direction. Plus maybe a little push in the or cycle. Okay, so if I start from a point P, I get psi of P, and then I want to prove that if I take a point Q that is that I obtain moving from P along the geodesic direction for a distance epsilon, the image of Q, Q tilde, is going to be. Again, I start from psi of p, I move in for the same amount in the geodesic direction, and then maybe I have to slide a bit along the orbit. This is what I want to try to convince. This is, I mean, it's, it's, it's far uh, to deduce from this the global result, but at least it's one idea to. to... This is because we have this commutative formula for geodesic. Uh, I mean, yeah, you will see how the proof goes. It's a bit of that, but it's also about the uh, polynomial divergence of orbits. Okay, picture. <laughs> so this is the same picture. I start from a point P, 
And now I take a point Q, which is the point P moved a bit like minus epsilon in the geodesic direction. Okay, what I know, I know psi of P is going to be somewhere, uh, I call it P prime. And now I want to understand where is uh, Q prime being psi of the image of Q under psi. Okay, what do I know? I know that uh, the, the orbit of P is going to be mapped to the orbit of P prime. And similarly, the orbit of Q is going to be mapped to the orbit of Q prime. Now I know the commutation relation between uh, or cycle and geodesic. So I know that if I move for time t uh, along the orbit of p, and then I move for time minus epsilon along the geodesic flow, I can almost close the, the quadrilateral if from q I move for a time e to the epsilon times t. Right? So here I move uh, for a time t. From Q, I move from a constant being e to the epsilon t, and I get a point that is again close to uh, h t of p. Okay? If epsilon is small, p and q are close together, and so also these two points, p t and q of epsilon t, are also close together. So the map of psi is just measurable, but measurable maps. If I'm willing to sacrifice an epsilon of my space, they are going to be uniformly continuous. And I also know that the Oro cycle flow is ergodic, is uniquely ergodic in this case. So if I look at the orbit of P, I will intersect the set on which psi is uniformly continuous a lot of time. So maybe 99% of the orbit, if the orbit is sufficiently long, is going to be in the set where psi is uniformly continuous. So this uh, shaded uh, uh, is a sketch, right? So this uh, shaded bit on, on the orbits is the moments where I intersect the set where psi is uniformly continuous. So what do I know about the orbit of P prime and the orbit of Q prime? Well, I know that every time the point PT is in the set where psi is uniformly continuous, and every time that this point here, Q epsilon T, is also in the same set, then their image under Psi are going to be close as well. So I know that if I start from P prime and I move for some time capital T, that is, it's related to T, but it's not the P itself. Then I'm going to be close to the image of the point uh, Q epsilon T under psi. That is going to be some obtaining from Q prime moving for some other time that will depend on capital T. I call it E of T of Q prime. So I have these two orbits. And what I know is that basically for 99% of the times, the point H capital T of P prime is going to be close to another point in the orbit of Q prime, where the, the amount I had to move is some eta of T. And if I think about it, eta of T is going to be E to the epsilon times T plus a sublinear term. So where does this come from? So if there was no time change involved, this capital T here would be the same as this little t here, if there was no time change involved. So if I want to know what this capital T is, I should write this little t as a time in the time change parameterization. And then that time is going to be the capital T in here. But the capital T difference with the little t is going to be the difference of the cocycle tau with t, which was a sublinear term. And the same for this time over here. So the, the amount, so if in the amperture setting, I have to move by e to the epsilon times t. After I do the, um, the isomorphism of psi, if here I move for a capital T, here I have to move for some time that is going to be epsilon times capital T up to a sublinear error term. Does this make sense? I know it's not rigorous. I'm just trying to, to give some intuition. OK, so again, what do I know? I know I want to know where Q prime is. I know that the orbits of P prime and Q prime are close or, or are at a sublinear distance if I parameterize the orbit of Q prime with the epsilon uh, e to the epsilon times t. OK, so now I make a guess. So my guess was that Q prime was obtained by starting from P prime and moving for the same amount in the geodesic direction. 
Okay, so now I don't consider P prime anymore. I would consider P tilde, that is my guess. So my guess was P prime moved for the same amount in the geodesic direction. And now, but instead of considering P prime, I consider P tilde. So P, the orbit of P prime and the orbit of P tilde are close if I move on P tilde with respect to this time, the same picture that I have in here. So if now I consider the orbit of P tilde instead of the orbit of P prime, I do get that if I move P tilde for time e to the epsilon times t, well, this point is going to be close to this point over here, and this point over here is close to this point over here. So I have that h of e to the epsilon times t P tilde is close to h of e to t q prime. So now I know that the orbit of P tilde and the orbit of Q prime are close <laughs> up to a sublinear term for 99% of the times. And now I want to prove that they have to lie on the same orbit. This, is the, this will conclude the proof. Does this make sense? So I have, now I reduce my problem to say, I have two points, I don't know where they are, but I know that they are orbits. So if I'm willing to tweak one orbit for a, in a sublinear way, these two points are going to be close 99% of the times. I want to show that this implies that the points have to be on the same orbit. This is the... Okay, so this is what happens on the quotient. So let me see what happens on the group, so on, on the cover. So start from P tilde, I take... Uh, so maybe P tilde is going to be gamma of G, so I take a lift in G of P tilde. And maybe let me assume that I start from a point Q prime that is already close to... Uh, tilde, so I can find the lift of Q prime in G that is also close to G. Okay, and now instead of following the orbit on the quotient, I follow the orbit on the group. So what happens is that, okay, I, this orbit over here, uh, in the, the, the orbit of P tilde here above, comes from an orbit of the orbital cycle flow on the group. Okay, now what happens to the orbit of the lift of Q prime? Okay, they start close, and now then maybe they wander off, they, they take separate paths, and then maybe it happens that at some point they are again close, not only in M, but in G as well. Okay, and then they will wander off uh, never to meet again. So remember that <laughs> the, the divergence of points was polynomial in time, and in G you basically have no identification, so you, you mentally you have really some parabola going on here. Right? So the the in, in, on the group, the, the amount of times that they are close is at most twice. They will be at most twice close, and then they will never meet again. Okay, and what do I know? Well, I know that they start close together, and then maybe at some other point, the orbit of G and the orbit of the lift of this point are again close, well, close up to a sublinear term. So this uh, green uh, curve is supposed to represent the, the sublinear error that I'm allowed to to, yeah, that I'm willing to tolerate <laughs> the sublinear error in the parameterization. Okay, so here I have the same pictures, right? So I start with two points, I lift them on the group. So the orbit of these two points, okay, maybe at some point these two orbits will come again close together in this green bit over here. But maybe on M, they were coming together before, like they are close together 99% of the time. So what does that mean? It means that on the group, the orbits are not close together, so I get to some other point here in purple that will lead to some other point in the orbit of G. The point in the orbit of L, L being the lift of Q prime, they are not close together, but if I apply an element of gamma, I can bring them close together. And then I have the same picture again in a, in a smaller, like for, for different points. Okay, this is... A... Gamma is this gamma is an element of my group gamma for which I'm quotient in G, right? Uh, so basically, these two points are different in the group, but when you go to the quotient, they are identified to the same point. Okay, so I want to color my orbit in this way. So I want to color the pieces of the orbit that the points are close together. Uh, and I want to use different colors every time I have to use an element of gamma to, to bring my points back uh, close together because maybe they wonder if I want to. Okay, so what do I get? In the end, 
I get a collection of blocks. That's what uh, Ratner called them. So a collection of time intervals that are contained in sub-level sets of a quadratic polynomial. So this green bit over here, so at some point they are close together and the parts where the, the, these two points are close together again is definitely contained in the sub-level set of the quadratic polynomial the, finding the distance between these points. Sub-level meaning the set of points that are uh, at distance at most epsilon plus a sublinear term. Does this make sense? So this in green are the set of points where the, the, the divergence of points is at most uh, the epsilon I start with and then the, the sublinear error that I'm allowed to, to commit. So I have a bunch of blocks that are, maybe I should have said, that are contained in sublevel sets of quadratic polynomials. The, the quadratic polynomials are the divergence in the group the, of the initial points. And uh, the, the, again, as we saw before, the, this, the, actually the divergence is linear in the geodesic direction and quadratic in the unstable or, or cycle, but I don't know where the point p tilde and q prime are, so they, they could be anywhere, so I have to take a quadratic uh, polynomial that's telling me the divergence. Okay, now I really use the properties of quadratic polynomials, uh, of polynomials in general. Uh, let, let's think about it. So let me say that I start from here. So the point G and L are closed, and then they are going to stay closed for this green interval. So they, they are really close together. And now I'm saying, okay, I keep flowing, and then at some point, I reach a, a moment where if from the orbit of this point, I apply an element of gamma and close again. But uh, this green bit is a sublevel set of a polynomial. And polynomials have this property that if a polynomial is less than epsilon for an interval of size 10, in an interval of size 20, I'm going to be less than 4 epsilon or something like this. So the, the polynomials, so if a polynomial is small in a big interval, in double that interval, the polynomial is still going to be small. It cannot grow too widely. So in that, in an interval of size double the green uh, bit, uh, well, I didn't have time to change fundamental domain, apply an element of gamma, and come close together. So if I have two blocks of the same of different colors, which means that I had to, you know, they had to really diverge and then apply an element of gamma to bring them close together. Well, this cannot be too close together, right? If they are different colors, they cannot be too close together. And if you make uh, stuff uh, things precise, you can prove that. If two blocks are of different colors, namely the picture before, well, there has to be a gap that is uh, at least uh, the size of the blocks. Does this make sense? This is a really the key property of the polynomial divergence that I'm using. That if I were close for a long time, I need to be close for a time that is proportional to the time I was close with. Okay. If Maybe I have two blocks of the same color. Sorry, so, yeah. and we also, so this was to justify that we can really think about the color sets as intervals, right? Because the polynomials. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, uh, so because before you used wooding, so we didn't know actually, so we are not in the whole space, right? We move some. Right, 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 right. I, yes, I kind of forget about uh, losing and just. Uh, Basically, forcing them to be intervals by looking at sublevel sets of polynomials that are going to be inter. And if I'm there, they are, I'm also closed. Yeah. Uh, so blocks of different colors are definitely far apart. They cannot be too close together. Blocks of the same color could be close together. But then I use again the properties of polynomials. That if two blocks, two sublevel sets of the same polynomial are close together, then I can take their convex hull. And I can actually bound what's happening in the middle. So if I have a polynomial that in two intervals that are close together is small, then in the middle it could have not spiked too much. So if I replace two blocks of the same color that are kind of close together with a, their convex hull, okay, maybe in the middle they went a bit farther apart, but not too much. Again, it's going to be some sublinear divergence as well. It, they cannot diverge more than sublinears if the, the gap I leave between the two sublevel sets is small. And this I'm using again the properties of polynomials. Okay, so I, I, maybe I modify my collection of blocks of this uh, 
colored things by gluing together blocks of the same color if they are too small. And by doing this, I have a new collection of blocks that satisfy the property that in those blocks, the divergence of the points in the group is at most sublinear. And blocks are not too close together. And they cover 99% of the time. So this new collection of blocks will cover 99% of the times because I was finding a block every time the points were close together, I could find a block by looking at the sublevel set. And the times at which they were the points were close together, coming from losing is 99%. And so here I'm taking more, even more than that. So this collection of blocks is a lot, like 99% of the time. These blocks, so they cover a lot and they cannot be too close together. And these, you have to do a covering lemma, but it's more of a combinatorial argument that tells you that this can happen only if one of these blocks was actually large itself. You cannot have a lot of short blocks that cover 99% of the intervals and are also far apart from each other. This hopefully intuitively makes sense. So what you actually find is that there has to be one interval that was actually very long of a length proportional to the capital T that you fixed. So this means that these two points that I started with on a very, very long intervals are at most as, at a sublinear distance, not just on M, really on the, also on the group. And we know that the divergence of points in the group is a polynomial, is, is genuinely a polynomial, constant M plus linear plus quadratic. And if they are at a sublinear distance uh, for a very long piece of orbit, well, this cannot happen unless the linear and quadratic terms are zero. And so this proved that these points are on the same orbit, actually. So I start from a point P, I move in the geodesic orbit, I look at what happens in the image, and hopefully I convinced you that what happens is that the image of the point Q tilde, well, it's going to be on the orbit of the point that I obtained from psi of P by moving by the same amount in the geodesic direction. And this is already a kind of a, I mean, we knew very little for psi, and yet we managed to, to prove this. Quantity. And then the, the argument continues, but this is just the main idea where really we use the polynomial divergence of points to, to, to deduce something. And the proof continues, but I thought this was uh, like uh, one of the, the key ideas. So I will stop here and thank you very much for. The same thing known in other groups of This is a very good cool question. Uh, so uh, I, I kind of try to push this uh, this argument, and so this argument could, can work uh, nicely in uh, in um, yeah any semi uh, under some natural assumption is much more general. So. If you want to know, so say that you look at the image of a point and then you want to know what happens at points that are in the normalizer of the flow, then you can prove that something like this happens as well. So the step that I didn't put in the slide is then trying to see what happens in the uh, unstable or cycle direction. So in, the, in a direction that is not normalized by the flow. And this is hard. And so we, we didn't actually manage to get a full generalization of this statement. But there is a very recent announcement by Linda Strauss and Darren Bai where they uh, they said that I think they proved uh, the full generalization of Ratner's theorem for, for Mojet. But uh, it's very recent and I also haven't read it uh, in details yet, so I'm not sure. But uh, I mean, so probably, yeah, the, the, the result is general as I want to uh, also other D groups, but it's, it's, it's very hard. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I think it's a hard question. But, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe, maybe. So again, uh, 
So in the, if you try to generalize to these two more general, the, the hard bit uh, that uh, in the Strauss uh, they managed to solve, the hard uh, part is when uh, you have other directions that are not the flow direction that gets expanded by some renormalizing. Uh, uh, so, well, at least maybe in the case where you really have maybe one dimensional, one dimensional, uh, or then if you look at the whole, uh, maybe at least in the case one dimensional, one dimensional, maybe there is hope, but yeah. So we gather again at 2.30 for seminar? It was planned to be a seminar on the base. I incorporated to our final semester. So we have a seminar and not so called the two week And then I a lot of us will move to the level. Then there will be still some, something going on in Dubai here. What about your plan? Thank you again. I'm participating in two weeks. So I just want to say that maybe we should thank the, all of the speakers of the school once again, even though they are uh, amazing talks, and I hope you are as satisfied as I am with the results. Um, so let's organize more things like that. <laughs>